Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I have the honor and privilege of uh, having not just a cool guy, but uh, just an incredibly talented musician. Uh, J.R. Robinson is known for being the most recorded drummer in history, but he's actually a, a very talented musician, producer, engineer. And uh, in fact, I'm going to let you know a little secret later that is his studio that we, I just discovered this sounds better than Capitol Records, and we'll find out how that works later. But uh, anyway, um, JR, thanks a bunch for coming on the show. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, first, I just want to thank our mutual friend James Harra for connecting us. James, I appreciate yeah. it. Love James, man. One of my favorite all-time guitar players. Yeah, great. He's going nuts on uh, uh, <laughs> the cur He's. I, I know, I see it. <laughs> have you seen him on like... <laughs> It, like he's doing these guitar things because he's like you can see he's just about to explode with boredom man you know i should call him man i should we should we you know we, we've been collaborating with all sorts of different cats so he would be definitely one to do that with yeah that'd be good uh another and also make sure you go to everyone loves guitar.com forward slash subscribe subscribe to the audio if you're watching this on youtube click the button and the bell down there and thank you let me tell you about jr grew up in a small town of eight thousand people creston iowa started playing piano originally at age five and drums at the eight ripe old age of eight he turned pro when he started his first band a little behind at age 10 he went to Berkeley in uh, 1978. He got his break and joined the band Rufus and Chaka Khan. He won his first Grammy with the hit record Ain't Nobody in 1983. He's literally the most recorded drummer in history. He's played on over, this is no joke, 500 million records sold. He's played on, I'm, like this is really abbreviated. I would have no time to do an interview if I read the full list. But here's some of the hit records he's played on. Artists by Lady Gaga, The Coors. Do you know... Uh, I think I looked. You played with Anto Drennan. Uh, I don't know if that was directly or not. Okay, he was because he was on the because I looked at the album. He's on a, the course. I did a couple of course records. Yeah, and I looked. He was on those sessions too. Great, great player. Lovely oh, guy yeah. too. Uh, Ikichi Azawa, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson, Rufus, of course, Chaka Khan, Stanley Clark. He was on my favorite, favorite fucking record, Rocks, Pebbles, and Sand. I listened oh. to. Is that the one where Stanley brought Lewis in also? Um, I don't or, think, I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't was, think so. I think you, were, I, it's the record. It was like 80 or 81. It was 80, I think. Yeah. Would it, Cause I remember that record. Cause I, the quote in my high school yearbook was from that song. Life is just a game. It was such a oh, great, right. great, great track, man. Great record. Uh, Brothers Johnson, George Benson, Bill Champlin, who was on this show. That guy's a warrior. Uh, oh <laughs> Herbie Hancock, Herb Alpert, George Duke, the Pointer Sisters, Glenn Fry, Tavares, Kenny G, uh, Donna Summer, Lionel Richie, Neil Diamond, Frank Sinatra, The Temptations, The Isley Brothers, John Fogarty, Dionne Warwick, Eric Clapton, Bob Seeger, Michael McDonald, Larry Carlton, David Sanborn, Steve Winwood, Peter Cetera, Randy Newman, Frampton, Joan Baez, Robbie Robertson, Paul Jackson Jr., who we had on here a while back, yep. Steve Warner, who we had on here a while back, Christopher Cross, Bill Medley, and literally hundreds of artists. Uh, John's been the drummer for Quincy Jones since 1979 and the drummer for Barbara Streisand from 93 to 2014. I had a, was John Shanks produced those records or some of them? Um, no, I mean, you know, it, it was, it depend on the orchestral stuff was like, um, you know, the executive producers and then Bill Ross, the conductor would do it. Okay. I had, cause I had John on here. I know he's done work. I know John though. Yeah. Uh, and he's also been the drummer for the Oscars multiple times. He's played on motion, motion pictures, soundtracks, including my cousin Vinny, that thing you do. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, Hairspray, Anchorman, and like one of my favorite movies of all times, Austin Powers, Gold Member, Dodge. <laughs> when you have two sons, man, you have to like, it's well, like a staple. I'm right there with you. Yeah, man, you got to watch all the Austin Powers movies. Dodgeball, Hangover, a great series, Hangover 1, 2, and 3, Batman vs. Superman, The Lion King, and loads of others. He's got uh, two solo, two or three solo CDs. Two. Two solo CDs and an educational DVD called Time Machine, which actually won DVD of the year by Modern Drummer Magazine. So if you're looking to, if you're a drummer looking to, you know, improve your chops, definitely check that out. Again, it's called Time Machine. And John has been touring with legendary producer and artist David Foster. John, thank you. Uh, 
so much for coming on the show, man. I'm exhausted just from reading this. Greg, it's my honor, man. And uh, when you know James goes, man, this guy Craig, and he wants to get a hold of you and stuff. And I go, but, but he's a guitar player. He goes, that's right. <laughs> well, like you know, fifteen percent of our guests are not guitars. Hey, listen, man. I, I could like pan over here, and you can see my rack of guitars over here. So I, I love. I'll tell you. You know, that, that instrumental night when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan, you know, and I'm, I'm drumming, man. I'm, I'm a little kid and I'm still drumming, but I see my older sister, like, Google-eyed when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan. And I go, uh, you know, brother-sister thing, and, and I'm thinking, I'm going to play guitar. Because after <laughs> I saw those guys playing guitar, nobody gave a shit about Ringo. Yeah. You know? it, was all, it was the three guys up front. And I go... Uh, and I'm I'm gonna learn. So I learned guitar right 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 after that show. Really? And but drums was just always your passion. Yeah, drums came by a bolt of God. Yeah, I got hit hard uh, at an I, early age. I read something just yesterday. In fact, it said that you know you're talented when something comes to you easier or more naturally than other people than it comes to others. That's interesting. Yeah. I haven't yeah. heard it put that way, but that's that makes sense. It's pretty accurate, yeah. I thought so. All yeah. right. Um, what? Obviously, you were super passionate about music in general at a young age. Where did that come from, or where do you think it came from? Well, I think initially I had it uh, coming out of the womb, but you know, it takes parenting. Even to this day, if the, there's 25 year old parents that have a, a little baby, and you influence that baby with all sorts of musicality, no matter what it is. I don't care what it is. That baby's going to become musical. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's the times where the parents stop influencing the children when the child stops. And the exceptional ones will power through it. My dad was a, uh, a doctor, but he also was a great violinist and a great piano player and arranged for chorus and uh, was just fantastic, and sang in a barbershop quartet. Oh, that's cool. And then cool. my mother was, uh, uh, she taught me about the word swing and used to play me big band records when I was a little boy. And so, you know, one of my, one of my statements has always been 50% of learning is listening. Yeah, man, ain't that the truth? So that's kind of a, how I got, uh, you know, I, my parents, I didn't have a drum set until I just about turned eight, you know, at the end of seven. And, uh, I remember cause my parents were getting divorced, excuse me. And that divorce definitely sh shook me up, but it shook my sister up more because she was older. So I didn't get it, but I was always just whining about, I want a drum set. I want a drum set. I want a drum set. So I was over at my dad's house, uh, which is like four blocks away. And they specifically kept me over there so they could set up this this old WFL set, which I still have. Wow. And, you know, how, so how, cool. However, the snare drum got stolen at Berkeley in 73. So I have a clone of that. And uh, I still have a lot of eyes out there looking. So Yeah, um, he stole JR's uh, on the off chance. If you've got his original, no questions asked, man. Just contact me old, or contact black, him. Black, black uh, early 40s Duco. There you <laughs> go. Please return it. Anyway, so I, I remember getting out of the car and coming back home and running up to the, the window because I knew some shit was up. And there was a little drum set sitting in there. And so I bolted in and sat down on it and held the sticks wrong like a, like a claw, like wrong. But the first groove I played was a, a swing groove, you know, thanks to my mother. Yeah. And so that was, that was kind of the beginning of the, you know, the, uh, it was kind of like... Um, when you, your passion gets acknowledged. Yeah. Uh, true statement. The number one thing successful musicians have in common from the close to 700 guests I've had on this show is support from parents. Number yeah. one, number one thing, like 99 plus percent. And just let me plug the young kids that are going to listen to this. Yeah, yeah, please. And if they're having a baby and, you know, they're thinking about, you know, I've got neighbors around me, one neighbor, this family over here, all baseball, all baseball, all baseball, all baseball, no piano, no violin, no drums, you know, so I can understand, you know, one passion level, but, you know, to be great parents, you need to, you know, I was an all-star basketball player, which oh, wow. you, you knew, so we could talk about that. I did, but I did, This guy is immeasurable in talents. Of course, I can't fucking walk now. <laughs> 
or you know, Lenny Demuzio <laughs> used to say he had a handicap. He you know, dragged that third leg along. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, breaks, man. Your first big break, I guess, was when you became a member of Rufus and Chaka Khan. Yeah, I mean, I, I had an, I had a really glorious upbringing, you know, with grade school, junior high, and high school jazz camps, music camps, blah blah going to Berkeley, but you know, when they, they, people talk about a break, it's like, I remember, um, you know, the drummer, Joe Hunt, I do he not Philadelphia. He was one of the great Berkeley teachers when Alan Dawson was teaching and Joe, I think Joe's still in the Boston area. Joe asked me to sub for him when I was 18 and play with, um, uh, Chick Korea's cousin. Her name was Lynn. Lynn Stewart, I think her name was. And she was a pianist, singer, jazz singer. So I went and played. And all of a sudden, I remember like, you know, I've been in clubs and famous people come in. And then you get all uptight. You start to overplay. And Chick Corea walked in. And I go, fuck. Holy shit. shit. And I always was, you know, we idolized Chick Corea because of, you know, it was a return to forever. And mm. it was the beginning of that massive band. And uh, I went up to him and I go, one day I'm going to play with you. And he looked at me and he goes, one day you will. Oh, uh, wow. I only play with him once. Uh, but the, the point was, I remember getting uptight about when he walked in. And uh, when I was out with my band touring in Ohio called Shelter, uh, is when Rufus and Chaka Khan all walked into the club. And I remembered what I remembered from that earlier night was don't get uptight. Don't get, uh, don't get nervous. Just be yourself. And sure enough, man, right at the end of the set, the whole band was sitting up in the front and they're, they're like, and then we were stopping and they talked to the leader guy. They go, can we sit in with your drummer? And I go, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. so the next set was the new Rufus and then shocker kind of want, you know, gets up there and it was, it was brand new Rufus. Yeah. And so it was about me learning not to overplay. Don't be somebody else. Be yourself. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, did you have to like, when you're in situations like that, because that, as, as you know, doesn't happen. I mean, it always happens the rest of your life. It may not be, well, you know, you're concerned about someone watching you play, but something that has a potential to trigger you. Are you, do you tend to be able to do that all the time? Like, talk to yourself and say, Hey man, I mean, like, that's what I do. I, I literally talk with myself if I'm stressed or uptight and I'll like try to look at me as if I'm not me, like I'm somebody else. Is, is that something that you do or do you tend to get wound up? Um, I don't get wound up. Um, you know, I think, um, I've been able to, you know, secure people skills and, uh, even, even if you get thrust into a session, where there's somebody in that session that maybe is not up to your caliber yeah. or there's somebody in the session that doesn't get the band concept, you know, you learn how to deal with certain issues uh, right. or, you know, now we have a box that we can just mute these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Technology's come to the rescue. Oh my wow. God. That's pretty funny, man. Does that, yeah. wow, that probably happens a lot. A guy at your caliber where you have somebody where probably less that they're not of good caliber, but they're not just considerate of the team. It could be, it, I mean, mm. it could be, but I've been really blessed, uh, you know, playing with like guys like James Hare or Dean Parks, uh, yeah. you know, or, or, you know, Lugather in the old days, uh, you know, Landau, uh, Thompson, Jackson. Um, I did a lot of work with Larry Carlton yeah. and, uh, you know, I learned a whole bunch from him. Uh, but, you know, to be able to be in into a situation, but George Benson was really an exceptional, uh, 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 you know, uh, to me, one of the greatest times I've ever, you know, learned. I mean, George Benson always thought of himself, excuse me, as the greatest guitar player in the world, man, I'm the greatest guitar player in the world, man. But, uh, in reality, he's just a cat that wants to play with some other guys. Right. And, he just, and he loves it. And, and he likes people around him that can help showcase his talents. Yeah. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed playing with George. That's awesome. man. All right. So once, uh, okay. At a certain point in time, Rufus sort of broke up. Yeah. Right. 
Um, and I know you came back from the, for the reunion much later, but once that gig was over, what did you do? Yeah. And that was an interesting scenario. Uh, initially the day I joined Rufus, well, I left and drove from Boston via Iowa to California, which I'd never done before. I was one hell of a trek. Yeah. And, um, and joined the band and, and then we finished up that 78 world tour and there were three gigs and the first gig was, uh, in Hawaii. <laughs> And uh, I go, wow, this is great. I'd never flown first class. We're going to Hawaii, blah, blah, blah. You know, but the whole band was, you know, at the end of a year's tour, they were strung out. And so, you know, I hung with Shaka right when I got there. And Shaka's looking at me and she's going, man, I'm leaving the band. I go, oh, my God. I just, <laughs> I just got in the band. She goes, well, why don't you come with me? And uh, you can get anything you want. I'll give you a record deal. I go, yeah, you know, because when you're, 23 years old you'll believe anything sure. and i basically looked at how gorgeous she was and i go no because the five the the, the four guys wanted me in the band so i opted to to wow. stay with the guys and struggle through when she left us and had i feel for you and those machine hits uh knowing that we were going to eventually get back together again so um that that was an that was an interesting thing, but right after let's see, well, how was this? Quincy Jones was asked to produce a Rufus and Shaka Khan record because uh, she hadn't formally left, and it was called Master Jam, and it was on MCA. Uh, but it was Quincy Jones was, was really good producer with with bands, but he didn't get a lot of bands. He had the Brothers Johnson and us. And uh, we were a lot more difficult for him than the Brothers Johnson. There were only two of them. Yeah. And uh, we were going through, you know, all sorts of shit. Chaka was going through his shit. And, uh, and I was fresh and young and bringing this energy. And what happened was uh, we had a couple of good hits on that record. And that record went platinum. And then right at the end of that record, I got asked with Ed Eckstein and Quincy, do you want to just stay on and we'll start recording Michael? I go, fuck yeah. I go, so I mean, in reality, my drums never even moved. They stayed wow. at a studio called Alan Zentz. And um, we had the same damn team with Bruce Swedeen and, uh, and, and the engineer. And uh, I literally went from Rufus to Michael without a breath. And, uh, and then we went into 10 more records right in a row. So Quincy Jones, as a, if, if people look at my DVD, uh, there's a point where he gets interviewed and uh, uh, he goes, you know, uh, I stole you from Rufus. He goes, and uh, he goes, it's the best thing I ever did or something like that. And I go, well, mission accomplished. That was, yeah, sick. man. Wow. So, so let me ask you a couple of questions about that. Um, you, you said it was Zentz. Was that, the, was that the Zentz in John Fogarty's? No, that's okay. Zance. Zance, okay, okay. That was Saul uh, Zance. Saul that, Zance, right. This was called uh, Alan Zance. Okay. And, uh, and it turned into a studio called Image. It was right around the corner from the newer um, record plant. Okay. Off of Sycamore in Hollywood. Um, why do you think, besides technical chops, okay, what has... in what do you think have been some of the things that account for your success beyond your ability to play drums? Because you've had like an unprecedented run here, man. I mean, literally no one's done something like that. Well, we're not done either. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Kind of old, but yeah. you know, it's the Lady Gaga perfectly quantized song. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, uh, you know, again, I go back to parenting, good parenting. Um, I go back to, uh, discipline, uh, not, not being a drug addict, you know, during those heydays, uh, getting, getting, getting to the studio early, getting to know your engineer, finding out what kind of mics he likes and how he likes to mic the drums and, 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 and get, having a give and take with the engineer about miking techniques, um, um, when you hear a song, 
immediately memorize it. And then, you know, when you look at it, and then there's a chart, listen to what the, the songwriter had intended. Maybe write it down uh, and then write maybe what you might do all during the same time. So the second time you hear the song, you already know the song. And I think a lot of people don't understand about um, you know, this memory thing and try to, you know, oh shit, I, God, I can't even remember what the B section was. Now, granted, cats are playing chords and there's a little bit more information sometimes, but in reality, I'm still, you know, running four limbs uh, and, and, and trying to create a band finished product from the get go. You know, for example, an off the wall, we used to use a Yuri seven frame click, like a film click. And I would be in charge of that because of my time. I had, you know, I'm very blessed. I have good time. So I would like listen to Michael and these songs that would come out from Rod Tepperton. And I go, I don't know. It feels a little slow. I think we should bump it, bump it up to here. Cause Quincy wanted everything cut. Bruce wanted everything cut with a click so that, so, so he could come back and edit later. And we were all analog in those days. Okay. No digital hadn't even come out yet. And so I would program all the clicks and then make sure everything felt right. And then we would go in and cut as a band. And we would find out at that point if, if indeed it's working. If it's not working, then what do we do to fix it? Okay, so a couple of things that you mentioned I'd like to talk about because I think they're really important. This is the second time you mentioned the importance of listening. You, you said 50% of learning is listening earlier. And then you, you said, listen to the song. So I'm hearing in that some of this is like efficiency, like pay attention and get the shit done right. The first or second time is part of the, the magic there. Your ability to, to, to put a final product together quick. Right. Yeah. And right. And and when you said discipline, what does that mean for you? Well, I think drummers, are, you know, I guess we all have discipline. I, I mean, when I went to Berkeley, uh, I love the guitar players, but there seemed to be a whole bunch of them. And I don't know if they were all as disciplined as the drummers were. The drummers are disciplined because of growing up techniques with rudimental training and, and uh, time training and uh, um, things like that. I, I think drummers are are uh i mean not to take anything like you know away from a chuck finley a lead trumpet player who are jerry hay or, or equally as disciplined and or any other musician but um i'm you know i'm i guess i'm prejudiced again. well yeah no, no but just I'm, i don't even care about just talk about you like how for you what does discipline mean Be, like because if I've, I've i read a lot and i i have read a lot over the years and the number they've done studies of uh, there's a book by a guy named Tom Collins. I can't think of the name of it now, but he went and did a study of like major companies around the world. What made them successful? And the number one thing was discipline. Oh yeah. For companies. So, and it's the same thing with people. I think it's the same thing with people, but for you, what kind of discipline are you like when you think disciplined for yourself, what does that mean for you? Well, let's look at it today's times. And I'm yeah. older now. We're all confined into our homes, like, you know, little mice, and um, am I practicing as much? No. Should I be? Yes. Uh, however, I know when a moment goes by or something, I'm doing something to stimulate that brain. Uh, and, and, and as far as actually picking up a pair of sticks and either playing on a drum set, I do that every day. I'll play the drum set every day or I will be on a pad, but most of the time it'll be on one of, you know, a, couple of drum sets are ro rolling around the house uh you know and i don't have these massive drum sets they're just drum sets for drumming yeah for, for groove and for swing and stuff and so if i feel that i'm not if i'm slacking in some way something will remind me and my eyes will go over to that practice pad i go yeah shit yeah you're right you know i gotta i gotta work the hands out you know and it's just it's very similar to a basketball when you, you know, when you put the basketball in your hands and you feel it, you feel the ball. It's the same thing with feeling the drumsticks. And yeah. so somehow something knocks on my head and says, hey, you know, don't slack. No, no, no slacking. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. That's, you know, like no different hearing you than you listen to, 
you know, when Michael Jordan was playing, you know, he's the first guy in and the last guy out. That's right. You know, he's there that's taking right. fouls. The great, and that's how you stay great, man. Thank you, because I think that is really important. And there's like some basic fundamentals like that that are not fun per se, but th- that's you know an important part of what why you've done this, man. Why you had this track record. Um. I'm going to mention some artists talk about how you got the gig with them, JR. And like, if there's any cool or interesting stories about working with them, start with uh, Eric Clapton. Okay. The first time I just expanded the screen. First time. That's scary. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all good. The, the first time I'm, no, no, I'm just, I, I, in that, that, that uh, Les Paul there. No, no, oh. I'll take, I'll take the 335. No, that's my baby. <laughs> Anyway, I'm, too, I'm so sorry. Oh, you got an L? Is that an L7? No, it's an Ibanez, man. Oh, that's, it, that's a, like a George. Yeah, it's it's like a 175. It's a really it's nice sounding guitar, man. Anyway, uh, Eric Clapton. Uh, we had gone, Rufus and Shaka had re-signed with Warner Brothers. Hmm. And um, I think because of that information, I met a lot of really cool people. And I got a lot of really great gigs after that. Uh, Lenny Warnaker was president of Warner Brothers. I, I got to meet Lenny. Uh, knew his son Joey when he was a little punk. That's funny. And, and gave him one lesson. And uh, <laughs> and uh, but they were always really, really uh, all the guy Joe Smith and all these all these Warner Brothers Russ Titleman and all these great Warner Brothers producers Michael O'Marty and we were all kind of connected and uh, um, uh, I got a call and I can't remember who called me uh, saying, you want to you know, do an Eric Clapton record and we're going to do it over at um, old Warner Brothers Studios, which was called um, Amigo. And it's like, you know, sometimes the brain forgets for a second. So, Oh dude, uh, you got a lot of information there. Give, uh, give yourself uh, a pass, man. <laughs> I know. And I do want to do a book one day, by the way. And that's just, you know, now we need funding. So that's a, maybe that's something off the record you can help me with. So we'll figure it out. But, uh, so I get a call and I go down and Nathan East is there hmm. and Greg Fillingans is there. And Eric walks in with a, with a fucking pig nose that remember those little, yeah, pig those little, I have one in my closet. Yeah. Those are cool as hell. What's with the pig nose? And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> that little, literally had a pig nose as the, that the volume. Yeah, and I go, and I go. You're gonna play that? He goes, he goes. Yes, I'm going to play that. And you know, he didn't know, but you know, I had a cream band, and you know, '66 and '67 in Iowa, and we'd win these talent shows, and it was a great band. I we we did everything, and I sang Crossroads, and did you? Know, it was fun, and so I, that was the first session I did, and I think it was on the record behind the sun, and. Uh, and he played yeah. his pig nose? That, did he legit? Yeah. Oh, he my God. Pig nose. And it sounded unbelievable. Wow. I like, yeah. I, I got, you know, I mean, he could, I always have this joke that I could probably put a couple of boxes together and sound great. You know, he could probably, uh, you know, take a Heath kit signal and make it sound unbelievable. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure that's pretty i mean look it's the magic is inside of you not in your equipment man yeah so that came out i mean and i didn't know a lot about his personality and i think it was 82 something like that or 83 and uh, you know i didn't know he was you know kind of going through a shit and, yeah he hadn't he wasn't sober uh, then, i don't think was he yeah, yeah no he wasn't he never shit together yeah so that was the first time i worked with him very cool um what second time you it was another time so, yeah, I worked with him three or four times. The second time was uh, Rob Reiner did a film called The Story of Us with, um, oh gosh, Blonde, who played Catwoman. Uh, Julie Newmore? No, 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 later. Uh, I know who you're talking about. I, don't, I can't, can't think of it. Like Newmar, that's like way yeah, back yeah. there. <laughs> uh, uh, she was in that movie with Mel Gibson. I, anyway, uh, and it was a, I can't remember who the, uh, the man was, but Eric scored the film. Was that like a soppy love story? Like a yeah, sad? Yeah, I remember like, seeing that. It's sad. Yeah. And uh, he scored it and we were at some legit studio. It was a legit session and, you know, we're, we're all in there. And again, it's the same rhythm section. It's Greg, Philly Gangs, right. 
Nathan East and myself, and uh, Eric comes in. And so I bring all the music in and hand, and hand it out to everybody. You know, here's your keyboard part, here's your bass part, there's my drum chart, and here's a, a lead sheet for Eric. And Eric looks at me and he goes, yeah, I can't read, I don't need that. <laughs> oh, wow. I go, oh, okay, cool, cool, I'll take that. And uh, you know, I'm just, just doing what I thought I should do. Yeah, 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 it was pretty responsible of you actually. And then, and then the, like the, the, the most memorable one was, um, was Change the World. Oh yeah, uh, that uh, you know, Babyface produced, and uh, and it was me, Babyface, and Dean laid that track down initially, right? And then all the other cat cats filtered in and uh, overdubbed on that. And so the talent that you've been around is pretty, like, impressive, man. I've been very blessed. I mean, you yeah. know, it's like if you plug your A game into a a B team. You're going to play like them. Yeah. In general. You know, yeah. So. That's great. Uh, Stanley, how'd you get connected with him and any cool stories about working with him? There's, there's stories that probably shouldn't be on the radio. Uh, <laughs> Stanley. Um, well, again, one of my just favorite people in the world, uh, you know, one of the greatest all time musicians. Um, yeah. I, I'll tell a story. First of all, I got a call. I'm not sure if he called me directly. I saw him somewhere. I think I met him in early 1980 or late 79 because uh, the you know, Rufus thing was very successful. And uh, he goes, man, I'd, I'd love to have you play drums on, on my records. I go, cool. Holy shit. So I, so I got a call. You know, he didn't know. I saw him at, uh, uh, you know, with Return to Forever in uh, 74. And like, like oh, this is the greatest shit. By the way, uh, Al DiMiola was in my class at Berkeley for two oh. weeks. And what happened? Just and, to... and this old woman, we're at right air trading class, and there's a bunch of us. And this old woman comes in, and she goes, is there an Albert DiMiola in the class? Raise your hand, Albert. And all of a sudden, you see him. He goes, you're excused. You just got the Chick Corea gig. And he walked, <laughs> Holy he walked out and goes like that to us. Oh, my God. That is so funny. That's my Al DiMiola story. That's but, great, uh, man. You're but, excused. You got the Chick Corea Yeah, gig. you got the Chick Corea. He didn't even fucking go to Berkeley. Come on, he says he went to Berkeley. Anyway. That's great. Um, <laughs> so Stanley calls me, and, and I think you, you were right. Their first record is Rocks, Pebbles, and Sand. Yeah, I think so. And I did a couple of things on there. Um, one, he always had a fascination for another bass player. So he could literally be his frustrated, frustrated guitar player self. And there was one track on there with Lewis Johnson, because Lewis and I were a team all the time. Okay. Playing all these records together, and uh, uh, I, uh, it was something funk. Um, you have to, I somebody have to look it up, but I, I don't remember the name of it. The name but of the track, it you mean? Had so much bottom on it, yeah. and uh, and Stanley's emulating Lewis's shit, and you know Lewis. Well, there's only one Lewis Johnson, God bless his soul, and uh, uh, but that track was really funky, and then after that. I get introduced to uh, uh, George Duke. Oh, from, wow. From, from Stanley. Stanley. And right then I joined Clark Duke at the same. Oh, my God. With, with Rufus. And I was thinking, oh, man, I would rather be here than do this Rufus thing because Shaka is really iffy, you know. If Shaka's on point, that's the best band to be in. Yeah. You know, because it's a rock, jazz, soul band with – mixed race and it was just it had a whole slime yes. stone vibe you know and uh and it was right for the times it was right for the times and yeah. it still may be right one more day but we'll see but so i started doing stuff with stan and george we did two records but we wow. did snl on a week year let's see so it was 1980 and i think that was year six so there's a video of us on Saturday Night Live, and it's the one, and I, it's posted on my uh, Facebook or website. I don't know where. You can find it. And um, we, we played a song. When I'm not, now, mind you, we were all young and just very, very, what's the word? Vehement or uh, uh, vile almost. Um, and we wrote a song called Wild Dog, which Stanley has always done. And it's... Uh, this was the one Saturday night episode where there were two musical artists. 
One was Cheap Trick and the other was us. That's weird. It was weird because Karen Black was the host and Karen Black was friends Actress. with Stan. Actress. Yeah. yeah, right. I remember her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, I think. She was very friendly with Stanley. So she goes, I've got to have Stanley in his band. So I got a call from Corinne Duke going, we're going to New York. So we, the, the three of us fly to New York and uh, Karen picks us up at a damn limo and, and we go on and, and uh, Lauren Michaels is going, oh shit, man, what am I going to do? We got two, two fucking musical acts, two fucking musical acts. What do we do? You know, and it's 10 till, you know, how you film SNL. And we came out and just, bam, gun, 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 gun. We, you'll have to watch it. I'm going to watch it. It's so if I look up SNL, uh, Stanley Clark, George Duke? Uh, maybe season six, Karen Black. Okay. And, or you have to look, look through uh, either my Facebook or my website. It's awesome. an obscure, but you'll find it. And um, it was like, after we had played that, it was like that Max L commercial with that dude where it was all slick back here. Yeah, I remember that. We just fuck, it was like we gassed everybody. That's so those cool, are, man. Those it's, are good days. It's interesting how he, because like, do you know, I'm sure you know Reggie Hamilton? Extremely well. Yeah, great guy, man. I had him here. We had a, a blast. Really but, talented. Oh, man, he was Stanley's bass player for quite some time. That's right. And, yeah. and also, um, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, I'll think of uh, uh, Johnson. Um, uh, I'll think of it in a second. Yeah, yeah, it was another guy. Yeah, but it's interesting because I said, wait a minute. Alfonso. How, Alfonso Johnson, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said to Reggie, I said, how is it that you were playing bass with Stanley? And he said that. He goes, he, I think he played piccolo bass or he was like a guitar player in the band yeah, when right. Reggie was holding down the bottom. Yeah, which is great for, for guys like that. Yeah, I think Steubenhaus also uh, was one of the bass players. Interesting. On, on Very cool. So how long did – so you were with uh, Clark Duke for how long? Just a couple of years, but it wasn't consistent. And, and and all during that time, I was recording. Okay. That's where a lot of these numbers came from. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, you know, I met, you know, Lionel, and I had known Lionel from the Rufus days. And, you know, I went in and, in 1981 and recorded You Are with him. And uh, it was, I knew right out of the gates that was a number one record. And, wow. And then, and then, you know, got into the more stuff with them. And then I started working for the Pointer Sisters. And, you know, the, 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 the coolest one, I think, after Michael Jackson's Off the Wall, which is backing up a year, uh, was Diana Ross. And we did a song called that, that James Anthony Carmichael produced. And Abe Sr. was playing bass and, my, and myself. It was called Missing You. It was a tribute to Marvin Gaye. And that was uh, a number one record. And it's ironic because uh, my first wife at the time was from Detroit and Diana was from Detroit. And the next day I had a three foot bouquet of flowers in my door and it said, "JR, just thank you for contributing this. I love you, Diana. And of course, I don't know if we have to edit this out. And my first wife was going, what are you fucking her? Man. Oh. <laughs> we, i don't care we can keep it's quite funny actually uh you should have said something like no if i was fucking her i would have gotten like a car or something <laughs> uh that's quite right. funny man wow but you yeah, know she's, like, she's into you really no i'm kidding how kind is that of her i was, do, I was yeah sure. that's god I'll that's never it. yeah what a that's man. That, you know, I, I always look at things like that, say a lot more about someone's character than, you know, uh, than other things. Cause that's like a really kind, humane, just compa it's, She doesn't have to do, do no, that. Uh, you know? She was very, very sweet and yeah. still is. That's awesome, man. Uh, Herbie Hancock. Ooh. Oh, let me pray. <laughs> By the way, ha happy birthday, a little yeah, bit later. That's right. I saw that. Uh, man, you know, I was thinking, I was looking, he goes, he's 80? I know. He's 80? I go, shit, man. I remember when he wasn't 80. <laughs> so, I mean, that's like getting to the Quincy Jones age. And then I, I didn't realize they're only six years apart. Quincy's 86? So, 86, yeah. yeah. But Herbie, you know, I think that. All of us drummers were in love with Herbie because of the Miles Davis situation. Okay. And, um, you know, when he was a young, young kid and, um, you know, we kind of like grew into him 
and, and still, in my opinion, to this day, he is the greatest living musician. Herbie Hancock. There's no question. And um, let's see, the first time, I mean, look, dude, dude I used to run around, I, I, I'd keep a vinyl stereo in my 67 Dodge Monaco 500. So when I was like, you know, at, at another city and I'd plug it in in my hotel and I'd put on Headhunters. And, wow. Uh, and I, I like, I'd be obsessed with that. So, uh, uh, but I first met Herbie, golly, I met Herbie the first time on a Quincy Jones session um, where he played on, uh, it was on The Dude, and he played on two tunes on that record. One was uh, I Know Corita, and he's really playing a lot of shit, almost too much. It's almost too much motion, and I noticed it, but, I, you know, I'm just a kid, and I'm yeah. not going to say anything. And then he played on another song, and, you know, if he didn't... That was do, probably a good career move, not to say anything. Yeah, I probably was. <laughs> yeah, but, I, you know, I remember Bruce Swedine, you know, the great engineer, and Quincy's right arm coming out to all of us session players and going, you guys get double scale. He goes, well, don't you care about what Herbie's making? You're just always going to get double scale here. And I go... Yes, you know, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that was kind of a lesson learned. But Herbie came down and, and did his Herbie thing. And then I got a call to go up to uh, uh, with David Rubinson uh, up to uh, shit. What was the name of the Herbie Hancock Studios up in uh, San Francisco? I don't know, man. So I, I sound something or it wasn't fantasy. But so I'd go up. Freddie Washington and I went up there and we did. Uh, uh, Light, light up the night i think there was a record and rod temperton had written a couple of tunes and and then i did another herbie record the next year down here and um and then you know a few years back we did possibilities uh which so you've was, had a very long relationship with him and i've played live with herbie uh on you know multiple uh you know if i can get Vinny ever out of there but uh <laughs> Vinny works well with herbie so that's that's a really great marriage um but I've done a lot of benefits with Herbie, and um, uh, it's just so so much fun just to, to be with. Do you have a preference? Like, you've you've had the really good fortune of doing both, which is like emotionally and mental and physically healthy and uh, creatively healthy to play both live and studio. Is there a preference that you have, or you know, th that's a great. I ask myself that question a lot when we go out with David now. And um, uh, because when we're out with David, it's just like we're in the studio we, we, because it's just, uh, our, we've got everything, the, all the best possible situation with OSA audio and, and, you know, my mix is just ridiculous. So it's almost like I am in the studio and all the studio work I've done. Um, do I miss it? Yeah. There, there are times where it would be nice to, to be able to get back in and the guys, but I think, you know, in my in starting to get into that, this last quarter of life, um, playing live is, is very important. And, you know, as I've got a studio here. Yeah. Yeah. Totally get it. Uh, Bob, uh, Herb Alpert, man. Talk about a talent. And a half. God, I met, I, well, I met him when it was the A of A&M. Oh, wow. You know, Albert and Moss. And, uh, you know, I'd be over working with Lyle in Studio B. And he'd be over in C, and he'd go, JR, can you come over and do an overdub real quick? And I'm thinking, all right, all right, I'm getting double paid. You know, he goes, yeah, bring the cymbal and bring a snare drum. So I, I do my thing and blah, blah, blah. Come back. And he goes, no, no, no. I just figured you'd just do it for free. You're kidding so, me. Oh, there was a bunch of that shit went down. And then, uh, but I did a whole bunch of Herb Albert records. So okay, so that was your pay. So you had an investment, and then you paid. Got the investment good. paid off. Yeah, and I uh, got on extremely well. And we had just played with him. He can still play his ass off. By the way, we did a, a, a tribute to Quincy Jones last year, mm. and uh, and there was a Hal Blaine. I, I don't know if I'm confusing my specials. No, there was a Hal Blaine um, tribute, and. Uh, that, ba -da, da -da, a taste of honey but it was great whole thing with how stopping it off and uh so I, I had to nail that and herb just looked at me and smiled and that's cool uh, 
yeah, he, he's a good guy. I have somebody, I have a, uh, his engineer coming or one of his engineers. Do you know, um, Benny Facone? B- Benny Facone. Yeah. Benny but, Facone. Yeah. He's, he's but, coming on the show. Yeah. Right. Right. He's, I think he's done a lot of work with Herb. He's coming on like soon. I think this week. Oh, uh, because he lives like right around. I will. I'll tell. Yeah, he, he lives is. close. Oh, and oh, he had gone, he had gone to Berkeley also. Yes, he did. And then he went up to Montreal after. Let me just make a note. Uh, that's right. He went to the late studio. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fun. It's, it's so, a very small world, man, isn't it? Oh, with Benny, Jesus. I did uh, Luis Miguel and uh, with Juan Carlos Calderon and uh, probably probably 250, uh, you know. Um, Sessions? Hispanic records, probably. Wow. But, yeah, he's got massive uh, in, in the uh, Latin community. with the, Yeah. Yeah. Bob Seeger. Woo! I mean, not for nothing, man. What a real feather in your cap. What diversity. It's not only just like the diversity, but like this is like the A-list guys in each niche, man. I, I mean, honestly, that's so cool that you've done that. You know, you really not not blowing smoke up here, but I'm yeah. just saying it's something to feel proud of because it's like when you look back at what you've done, it's like, man, this is very musically important stuff that you've worked on you know so uh, congratulations in all seriousness this is great thanks yeah yeah bob was great um i got a call real quickly from uh, russ kunkel uh, <laughs> russ had russ had was doing the like a rock record and and russ goes i got another gig man you gotta bail me out you gotta bail me out i go okay it was bob singer i go oh great i always loved rambling gambling man in 1968 yeah, some old stuff was great of his. It was great, and and you know he was kind of an R and B rock singer from Detroit. And yep. So I I go okay, I get in there and I'm working with this Silver Bullet band, and uh, I didn't realize, you know, I was always been a snare whore, and I and I'd have deep old Ludwig snare drums and stuff. I didn't realize that they were doing 25 takes per song with fat deep snares. Oh so my god. Playing, Takes two, take three. Oh man, this is great! And look at the guys are thumbing me up, getting it to take eight. And finally, I talked to the Punch Andrews producer guy. And I go, "What's wrong with that take?" He goes, "Nothing. Let's do another one." So twenty-five takes per song. That was just their system, like yes. Wow. Who, who came up with that? That sounds Punch. like something the studio owner would come up it with. Was Punch Andrews, his manager. Wow. And I'm going, well, this is a one-off. Uh, you know, and Bob goes, man, I want you to join the band and move to Lake Michigan. And and I go, no. So uh, that was, you know, <laughs> I enjoyed it. That, was- uh, that particular record, um, uh, Rick, v- uh, what's his name? Was it Vito? Rick-, Rick Vito was on that, right? Yeah, Rick Vito. Yeah, I had him on my show ages ago. He's the guy who did the slide on Like a Rock. It's like yeah. the most famous slide lick ever. Yeah, Rick's great. Yeah, he's great. Man, you talk about a guy. That guy is like, I think he's 70. He looks like he's like 45, man. He's in great, you know, good-looking guy, great shape, man. Yeah. He, he got hit with the good jeans. Uh, um, see, now we don't have to wear jeans anymore because we're all isolated. Man, I see this on, on Facebook all the time. Everybody's like, it's like David around. Letterman world now. Like we can all be pantsless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, at the end of this interview, Jr. will show you his pantsless. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, did you work with Frank Sinatra? You did, right? Yeah, I uh, I met Frank first with uh, we did a gig in Las or Palm Springs for his wife, uh, where there were three big bands. It was uh, the Quincy Jones Band, the Sinatra Band, and. Uh, I can't remember the other man. It could have been the Herman man or something, but that's the first time I'd met Frank. And then what I, the only thing I ever did was, I think it was on, it was really ironic. I replaced Steve Gadd's drums on some, I think LA is my lady, but not that song. It's on that record. That's so I, I basically came in and overdubbed over Steve Gadd. I go, Oh, with that. I, I even looked at Quincy. I go, really? Yeah. No. So, was Frank, was it intimidating? You know, he's such like an, uh, an he was not, he was not there. Oh, he was not there. Okay. He was not there at that point. You've done a shit ton of really cool movies. What was your first like entry into that? And how did that 
aspect of your career grow? Because I mean, you've worked on just like tremendous. Uh, well, like yourself, you, you know, you spread yourself with revenue stream and, you know, at my disposal was I was a union musician and I can read my ass off. So, and I, and I, and I can be a chameleon, which is perfect for the uh, motion picture and TV world and jingles. So, and back a lot then, of reading on that. And in fact, that's the key to your success. As far it's as I understand. Definitely. Uh, you, you've got to be an A reader and, uh, and, and, and see these notes and don't be afraid of them and stuff. So I think I got a call from a contractor. Um, and I, I'm not sure the exact call, but uh, I know Neil Steubenhaus was instrumental in helping me break into the TV and film world. And I know that I did one, I did a session with Ron Howard uh, called uh, Night Shift. Oh, yeah, sure. With, uh, what's his name? Uh, Fonzie. Uh, yeah, Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler and um, uh, Michael Keaton, I think. And uh, Yeah, that's right. He was like a nurse Bert, in there, I think, I think Michael Keaton. I think Burt Bacharach wrote some shit in that movie. And, yeah. And we, we had a song, Rufus had a song in the movie. And um, but, uh, I, and I, I did... That was one of the first ones I did. And then I kind of broke in. I mean, I started doing these films, which was really cool, working with, like, Tom Newman and, and, and different things. And, and uh, then, then I started doing the, some of the Simpsons episodes where they brought me in thinking that I'm a great mallet player. And I'll never forget because Bob Zemini was doubling on drum set but it was a left-handed set because Bob was left-handed. And I go, I'm, I'm the drummer. I should be playing drums. They go, JR, go play a, a, a xylophone. <laughs> oh, fuck. Or, did you, like, do you know how to play? Did you know how to play xylophone? I did. I, okay. My second instrument at Berkeley were mallets, but I hated it because, you know, as much as it is like a piano, you're still dealing with, you know, fingering out distances. Yeah. I suck. I suck. So I go, you know, put me on timpani you know let me play piatti timpani and snare drum and, and all this other stuff so they, I, I learned right there that i'm not going to be playing mallets uh right. you know, for the oscars that's yeah but at least you spoke up man well i yeah well you know when you it's a c sharp and it's not yeah better to, yeah i hear you man uh anyone else that you want to chat about that was cool or funny or interesting yeah. story? um peter frampton yeah, let's do that. Peter Frampton was, uh, became, and, and still is, a very good friend of mine. And um, back when I lived in uh, Agora Hills, I lived way out in the country in this beautiful thing, and, and the Lakers had just won the 1987 championship. And I was very Magic Johnson, and he was a friend of mine. And I'm just, you know, I'm probably boozed up and celebrating and hooping and hollering, and all of a sudden my phone rings. You know, I thought it was going to be like filling games or, or somebody. To talk about the, the game. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, oh, wow, what's it going? what about that play? You know, yeah. he goes, yeah, it's Peter, Peter Frampton. <laughs> I go, no fucking way. <laughs> oh, man, you're just, somebody's joshing me about the Lakers. No, it's really Peter Frampton. I go, oh. <laughs> oh. I go, you know, I was just watching the Lakers. He goes, I don't watch basketball. <laughs> giving me all this shit like like there goes my balloon is yeah your head is like uh yeah he goes, i would really love you to come in and play and i went in and uh I recorded with him the next week and it was great and uh we went and we played um right after that the arsenio hall show and i think it was the record was called when all the pieces fit and and you know we had massive long hair we all had long hair and there's a, a a video of that from the Arsenio Hall show. It, it is rocking. Arsenio it is just on fire. And I'm thinking, this is great. I, you know, I've always had this fantasy to, you know, to have a, you know, be with a rock guitar player, you know, and, and to play, it's not just R and B, you know, it's like rock and roll. And, you know, I grew up in Iowa playing rock and roll. So, uh, Wait, and it wasn't, uh, What's his name? Tommy Boland from Iowa. Tommy was from uh, Sioux City, I think. And yeah. I never, never got to meet Tommy, unfortunately. Yeah, Sioux City, yeah. Okay, uh, sorry imagine, about that. Imagine if he stayed alive. Holy shit. It, what, a, what an amazing, just 
I mean, incredible guy. I mean, yeah. I don't know why he's not mentioned more often, but you listen to all the stuff he did. It's just, even the stuff with Deep Purple was freaking amazing. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, uh, Steve is unbelievable in Deep Purple right now. So. Oh, yeah. Steve, and he's also a very nice, lovely guy, man. Well, you know, and Ian and I are very close. Uh, I, 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 he's supposed to be coming on here. Oh, you got it. You should, it's too bad we can't have oysters because uh, Ian, <laughs> Ian and I are oyster bros. <laughs> but, uh, you know, getting back to, to Frampton, then later as time went on and the 90s came along, I got a call. We, we had already done four records together. And I turned them on to Chris Lord Algie, the engineer. And um, um, Chris should say thank you very much because he made a shitload of dough from Peter. There you go. I, I got a call from Miles Copeland. Oh, uh, Stuart the, Copeland's brother, the manager of the police. And he was managing Peter. And he goes... Yeah, and I need you to come in and uh, let's, let's talk about the tour. I go, what tour? He goes, well, you want to go on tour? I go, yeah. I come on in. So I walk in, and um, it reminded me of one of those James Bond shots of of uh, uh, the Spectre, and you can't see the guy's of it's, Spectre. It's like <laughs> look, it's like this. Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 or it's like this. <laughs> and, 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 and he had like a Persian cat on him and I, and I was trying to negotiate with him, but I couldn't see him. You know, it was like one of those things. And because it was the light was behind him or something. No, it's just, it was, I don't know. I, I, it was how I envisioned Miles Copeland. That's so, so funny. So I, I made my deal and yeah, all right, yeah, all right, we'll talk about it. All right, you can go. So I go and you know, I, of course I got the deal. Okay. And, good. Uh, we went out uh, with Peter for a little over six months and it was, uh, it was great with John Regan and the, the late great Bob Mayo. Bob and that Mayo, was yeah. a true rock band. And we did um, Frampton Comes Alive 2. And that's on video. And I highly recommend that even to this day. I'm still pl I'm just playing a single kick pedal. No bullshit. When just, was that tour? It was 96. Okay. And we did that at the Fillmore West. That's so we cool. Man. What, what a great, uh, you know, you probably listened to that as a kid a million times. You know, what a great I opportunity. Got, I got tired of Frampton Comes Alive 1 because I guess I, I don't know. I, I, I think there's too many girls liked it. <laughs> That's really cool, man. Who, uh, tell me the artist, player, producer, or even mentor that you have learned the most from and and can you give maybe give some examples of some of the things you learned could be about yeah. music could be about business could be about life whatever you Quincy want Jones. Quincy Jones and uh you know he's he, he's the best uh he would uh, say things to you like you know leave your ego at the door um you know if I was like fucking up he, he'd just come out and on my chart or on a, a blank piece of paper write two bars of something and split and I, I'm looking at it, and I'm going, oh. <laughs> so, you know, you implement. Um, his, his, his production was uh, un, unlike anything, and, and he would come in, if the rhythm section was failing, he would come in and say things like, you got to stroke the pussy. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then turn around and walk out. I mean, he wouldn't smile. He'd just turn around and walk, sit back down, and all of us are like, what did he say? And all of a sudden, and then the next take, we got it. Interesting. So, so but his his, uh, his knowledge and his history has definitely rubbed off. His production techniques have rubbed off on me. His uh, perfection, his kindness, um, his compatibility, his uh, love, you know. So there's he's the high point. You know, I saw the documentary about him. I had no, I mean... I thought I had a decent work ethic, but like, I've never seen any human being like work like that. Right. And it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's, you can't compete with that. And nobody, there's a reason why he's been so prolific. That's right. You know, um, the hats off to him. Tough question. Top three experiences you've had musically. Oof. I mean, when I was in high school, I won an award, uh, which, it was, a, it was somewhere, someplace in Indiana, 
called, it's called the Arian Award, A-R-I-O-N. And it's some guy named Arian, I guess, who presented uh, high school musicians an outstanding award. So I won that award and that made me, made me feel recognized, uh, even though I wasn't trying to win an award. So that was one. The second one was joining Rufus that night uh, because of that break. And, you know, I mean, there's the, the third one, you could uh, put a, a lot of stuff into it. Like, you know, We Are the World, sure, that was great and everything. But, um, you know, winning a Grammy with Rufus was great, too. But I would say Steve Winwood. Working, okay. with, working with Steve Winwood because, uh, you know, a lot of people... I mean, to me, he is the epitome of British royalty in rock and roll and, uh, and, and kind of an unsung hero for it. And we did two records with him uh, back in the high life, you know, with Higher Love and all that. God, and then, what a great record. And then the second one was Roll With It. And uh, I got to play with Tony Levin on that. And, but the, f uh, the first record, it was, it's like Dark Side of the Moon to me. It's like the shit. That's so cool, man. I saw him, um, I think he was playing with Santana or open for Santana, and he came and joined Carlos on stage. He's a hell of a guitar player. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I never, knew him. I yeah. never knew him as a guitar player. You know? I was shocked how, like, he was really tasty, man. You know, I mean, he's not like a shredder, but he, I, he plays, he knows how to play great, man. That's right. That's right. Yeah, he's ridiculous. You know, it's interesting when I asked that question probably half of the people I asked that question to their number, their first response is always very similar to yours. The first time I, I got this award in high school or the first time my high school band that I played in played to a major club that the nostalgia and validation of that is really strong. Well, you, you know? just, it just made me forget about something. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have a, a three plus. Yeah, man. Go ahead. Back in 69, my junior high jazz band won the Mid-America Jazz Festival. That's big stuff, man. First time we made a record, and I was ever recorded. So I've got that record. That's like, I, I forgot about that. So I guess I get three and a half. So. Yeah, man, that's perfect. <laughs> um, is there anything you haven't done musically that you want to do? Uh, I mean, you know, living in Hollywood, there's this competition with uh, Oscars, Oscar songs, which are generally just awful. They just they pick awful songs. And uh, um, the, the, the Gonna Be All Right song that Maya and I wrote for the Bronx USA, we did submit it to the Oscars, but they've got their powwow of yohos that are yeah. they're selecting from. Is there a lot, uh, of nepo a lot of nepotism in that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, we're also, us composers are going to be up for an Emmy for this film, which, hey, you never know. That, that would be good. Uh, Dude, let's talk about that. Uh, so JR scored a movie, or a good chunk of it, called The Bronx USA. Uh, and I know you're really proud of that. So talk about that. How did you get involved in it? How did it come about? And, you know, just whatever you want to talk about it, man. Well, I'm, uh, I got involved because uh, my friend Danny Gold, who is a, the film director for that movie, uh, we did a, f a movie a couple of years before called uh, If You're Not in the Obit, Eat Breakfast. And that, <laughs> that, that movie was with Carl Reiner and, uh, uh, you know, Mel Brooks and uh, Dick Van Dyke and Betty White. And so it's all these old people that are still really, really, really active. And so we were like a band uh, in, in the film. Uh, which was great. And we did a thing with Dick Van Dyke. And so that led into this next movie uh, and asking, and it was actually the first time I'd scored legitly for a film. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm set up in the studio here. Uh, so it was a bit of a learning curve, but I was thrown music that was uh, uh, within my wheelhouse that then I can embellish and make, make the film better because of that. So I did like nine or 10 cues and then had two songs in the film too. That's really cool, man. What did you, um, what was, what did you get most out of that experience? Uh, I think the end result, uh, when people that weren't even with us that saw the movie, uh, it, it touched them. So to be a, a part of a, a large group that basically you're, 
your your uh, you know it's like intimate even though there's a whole bunch of people it takes to make a film uh, to know that that's touched people i think that's what the best part of it is that's nice man and and that you created it from nothing well i mean i had inspiration uh, via film so you know but i mean but you created the music yeah definitely yeah that's really cool man yeah any low points, JR, a dark period you've had to deal with? And how'd you get through them? You're smiling, so let's go. <laughs> have you and I been outside lately? <laughs> hey, you yeah. know, I have, a, I have a fucking PA system in the garage. I, I, I thought about just, I, I'm on a cul-de-sac. I'm going to bring the, bring the PA system outside, put a bunch of fucking microphones up and maybe masks <laughs> and, and, uh, and have people start coming and singing. You know, I don't know, but... Um, <laughs> You know, the old days, listen, when I first joined Rufus in 1978, nobody knew who I was. Yeah. Nobody. I didn't have hardly any endorsements. I think the first endorsement I had was Slingerland Drums. I was struggling to get a Remo Drumhead endorsement. Wow. And, uh, I, you know, and I, I, and I, almost, I almost thought there could have been a prejudice thing going on. Even though I'm white, you know, I was in a black band and, you know, maybe certain companies perceive you differently in that way. But... I don't know if that's true or not, Sure. Uh, but during those days when I joined Rufus, we had a solo deal with ABC Dunhill and ABC Dunhill was the Crusaders, Steely Dan and Steppenwolf. Wow. And us. And we were the, we were the holdovers. And then all that merger went to MCA. And that's why you saw all of us go over to MCA and which we used to call music cemetery of America. Oh, bad, huh? They say, oh, say, they totally fucked everybody. And, uh, but before that, we had done this one record called Numbers on uh, ABC Dunhill. And I helped like bring Freddie Hubbard in because I had known him. And I was learning, it was my very first real record. And I was learning how to not, uh, you know, I'm coming out of Billy Cobham world live. I'm playing hard and fast. And I had to learn how to not overload sound pressure and microphones. And, and that was a curve. And, and the engineer, Roy Halley, from uh, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, helped, hit me to how to control sound pressure. But the dark point was nobody knew who I was. And I was trying to get other gigs. And Rufus wasn't paying me hardly anything. Really? So I, I was using my basketball chops, going to Balboa Park in the Valley and hustling basketball. And I met a kid named Tommy, Tommy Cedros was his name. And uh, he always, always was high. And uh, I, I made friends with him. And we would hustle two on two. You know, I'd make five bucks, ten bucks. And yeah, that's, yeah. How, that's how I got by for a little while. Wow. Holy shit, man. Wow, that they, is amazing. They couldn't beat us. And then I got invited on the weekend with Jackie Jackson. Michael's older brother yeah. to come out and play with the real ballers. And, you know, they're hitting each other in the face and shit. And I go, man, I am not doing that. You know, and so, so I, I bailed on that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I was dark. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, I mean, but you know, you do, you got to do. Yeah. You know? And it's good. That, hey, at least you had that talent that you could fall back on. Yeah, of course, now, you know, I, I can't jump a quarter of an inch. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't need to, thank God, right? Oh, I, I don't know, maybe. Any, anything else? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I went through two uh, bad divorces, which was, uh, you know, uh, not great on the children. And yeah, I'm sure. I've got three beautiful boys, John, Chris, and Jack. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's made, it, made them stronger or, 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 or weaker, but I'm hoping stronger. Yeah. I set up relationships with the kids. You know, Jack still lives here half the time. Oh, great. And, uh, he's a great drummer. Um, you know, it was just a lot of wasted effort and monies dealing yeah. with the court systems. And, I, and I, I was kind of suckered into that crap. So, um, you know. The, the thing with divorce is getting married is difficult enough. There's no rule book. But at least it organically it feels like you're moving in the right direction yeah getting divorced because i've got divorced once many many years ago it's re how do you go there's no there's no frame of reference to unwind that man it's really 
you know, degrees of loss on, on all levels. No, and, and, I, and, and then we'll, we'll put this puppy to bed. One, one idea was there was one set of attorneys that wanted to come in in my garage and measure my cables <laughs> that are in a fucking box. Oh, you know, these because be that's an up. asset. Yeah, that's yeah, that's an asset, baby. Here, I'm gonna. How about I got a cable for you? Oh yeah, man, that is so, sick. Yeah, we're putting that one to bed. Uh, yeah, man. It was another quick dark time. However, I got compensated well. Was uh, Lenny Warner Kirk, again from Warner Brothers called me and he goes, "You got a band, right, Jr?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, John Fogerty is looking for a band. Why don't you give him a call, or he's gonna call you?" I go, "Okay, cool." He calls me up, and this was 85, early 86, 85, something like that. And he goes, I, wanna, I want you to be my drummer, and you've got a band, so let's go. It's like, just like that. I go, just, okay. He goes, but let's go down and let's rehearse the blues first. <laughs> I go, and I hired Steuben House, Marty Walsh, and Alan Pasqua was my band. Marty Walsh? Where did you know him from, Berkeley? Marty and I had a rock band uh, out here oh, with. He's uh, originally, yeah, he's originally from LA. With Billy, with Billy Sherwood. Yeah, yeah, I had him we on had the a, show. We had, a, we had a fucking a couple of bands, Marty and uh, Marty used to be one of our guitar players that would come in and out of the session world. Okay, right, and, right. And I'm, you know, now he's at Berkeley, and I kind of helped. I wrote his acceptance letter to get him in, and oh, cool, and man. Marty's on fire, man. He's like king out there. So yeah, he's having. A but good time. um, we, we we had a good band, and. Uh, uh, we couldn't play any Credence tunes. And I used to love Credence because he was getting sued by Saul Zantz. And so we, w we went out and we did this record called Eye of the Zombie. Yeah. It's just dark shit. Yeah, it was very dark. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we'd have people throw shit at us in these shed tours. What, just because he wasn't playing Credence. That's right. And he didn't, nobody realized at the time he wasn't allowed to play Credence. It, he couldn't even tell, talk about it. So that was, wow. it was a, bit of, a bit of a dark moment. That being said, it was a pretty good record. It's just, it is pretty dark, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything that you've done that at the time was out of your comfort zone, but you did it anyway, and it turned out to be a big break for you? Mm. Oof. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I can't really think of anything. Um, I, I've always been able to adapt. And uh, I mean, you know, I, 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 this is not even related, but I, I've had like, like Christoph Beck, the film composer, you know, who we, we did um, uh, the hangovers and stuff. We were doing something, I don't know, it was dodgeball or something. And he had written for two bass drums. <laughs> Like, literally, I had to write, read the fucking bass drum part. Oh, he wrote two bass drums for you, knowing it was just you. Yes. And I go, man, this is some hard shit. Because, like, you know, these guys write from their finger programming. And so I had to go in there and, and try to, I go, oh, dude, I, I'm not going to be able to play that. So, I mean, that, that was, I, I'm, I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to be playing in some 17-4 band. Yeah, yeah. Some avant-garde uh, weird thing. So, um You've always been really, it's, I don't know you, but it seems like you've always had a comfortable level of, of confidence in what you can do. And I bet that helped you get gigs because people feel, you know, it's like when you go to the doctor, man, if you go to somebody that's like, uh, makes you feel you're in good hands, it's like, that's how you feel, you know, right. and I, bet, I bet that served you really well. It's been good. To, and you know what? It's, it's been good to have a, a, be a master of confidence. You know, and I think it's important, not only with drummers, but, you know, all musicians, you know, they sometimes, and I, I see guys, you can see timid people. And what you want to do is make sure, and when I do, on occasion, do private teaching, uh, I, I try to teach confidence. And, you know, and if you can't play like Vinny, who gives a fuck? You know, play yeah. Like, you know, play like yourself. You know, no, fucking nobody plays like Vinny. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, don't, 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 I mean, he's somebody to compare. Uh, but not really, you know, it's just yeah. he's on another planet. So play like yourself. No, I think that's great advice. And I, and I think that I've talked to so many people that musicians that suffer from like imposter syndrome. It's like the opposite of that, where they feel like, man, I hope I don't get outed. Right. And they don't need to feel like that. It, you know, it's just like, you know, but yeah, I think that confidence has really served you well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, favorite 
guitarists and bass players you've enjoyed playing with? God, you've <laughs> got a Larry <laughs> Um Dean Parks, Lukather, Landau. Landau always reminded me of a, a guitar player that comps like a keyboard player. Yeah, he's the a great player. Right? Landau. Um, Paul Jackson, indirectly now Rogers, because we've never physically been in the same room together, except in the old days when Sheik would open up for Rufus, which was some fun days. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, Michael Thompson, you know, I've had like five rock bands with Michael. Uh, James Hara, just one of the most soulful cats there is. Uh, Peter Frampton, to me, is the probably greatest unsung guitar player on the planet today. And people need to really listen to his playing. Um, you know, the, the legends with Clapton. Uh, I always liked Eric because he, he was understated. He understated his playing. He didn't play too much. Uh, you know, unlike, uh, you know, some of these other flurry guys. And I know there's a bunch of guitar players I'm, 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 I'm forgetting, but uh, bass players, you know, Nathan East has always been at the top of the list. Neil Steubenhaus. Neil's time is better than any bass players I've ever played with, ever. That's His amazing. time is absolutely precise. Uh, Abraham Laboreal Sr. has this thing about him that makes you dance, and uh, it's really kind of fun to play with. You know, we did uh, Under the Rhythm of the Night. Da -da 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 -da, yeah. And then we did All Night Long, All Night Long. Sure. We did, which were both similar. Um, Freddie Washington, great mm -hmm. bass player. Um, Stanley Clark. Stanley mm -hmm. Clark is funny uh, because he, we had cut a number one record with Clark Duke called Sweet Baby. And, and, and he's, he's playing doom, really short. And he's looking at me, he goes, what do you think? And I, I go, well, you're, he goes, what do you think of my bass part? <laughs> He's asking me. And I go, it's great. I go, you know, you are, you are muting a lot of the notes. He goes, oh, should I not mute so many? I go, no, I don't think you should mute so many. Oh, so he didn't, and he went back and did it over. Well, kind of. But, I mean, if you listen to it, it is what it is. Yeah. And, uh, God, what other bass players? Um, uh, who else do I play with? It's funny. I like... Um, we're always looking for uh, newer bass players. I want to play with that kid on Facebook who's 10. <laughs> that kid, he, 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 I haven't seen him. There's so many. I was at NAMM and they had kids there like that. This kid looks like he's like maybe Filipino or something. I don't know, man. He, he plays the cross between like Rocco and, and uh, uh, it's just amazing. And Jocko and any of the Jocko. That's pretty cool. He has some talented young kids out there, man. Uh, Today, some 50 years after you started, what fuels your obsession to play still? Um, I feel that, I mean, when I walk around my house and see my drum set, it, it, you know, it's like, it's like a good woman and I need to play it. I hear and, that, man. And, and, and it doesn't yell back at me. And, and uh, <laughs> A good woman doesn't yell. <laughs> okay, then. <clears throat> wow, look at the time. <laughs> uh, it's just like just the spontaneity of playing on cymbals and drums and, and stuff coming back at you and, and, you know, maybe trying something that I'd not tried before. So it, it just, it, it, it keeps me, it, it keeps me fluid. And, you know, I write, you know, from the keyboard guitar perspective, I don't always, matter of fact, I rarely write from the drums perspective. So then if I'm writing something that's, that's really interesting. Hip, I know that I can always put drums on it. I don't have to go to uh, one of those drum programs. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I, I've saved money there. Yeah. No, that's interesting. You don't write from a drum perspective. Well, I guess that's the, pro well, that would be appropriate because you're not, you're not, you're writing for drums. So yeah, but that's, that's interesting. I never thought of that. Man, tell me your top three Desert Island discs. No Oof. particular order, just for this minute. This is hard. Uh, oh, Billy, know, man. Cobham, Billy Cobham Spectrum. Um, God, I think I even wrote anything from Frank Sinatra. And uh, Buddy Rich, Big Swing Face. I like the Sinatra, uh, kind of the medium year days, you know, with the Basie Orchestra. You know, and that, that's kind of the shit that was swinging hard. So 
Yeah. What's the like, buddy record? Big Swing Face? Big, big Swing Face. Yeah. It was recorded live at the Shea in uh, Hollywood. Tell me uh, best decision you ever made, JR. Ooh. Joining Rufus. Yeah, that really was a pivotal thing for your whole career, wasn't it, man? It did. It changed everything. I mean, you know, and I, I was I was gracious. I, I mean, I, I met Jeff Picaro, and, and Jeff was gracious enough to allow me in and not have any sort of jealousy or qualms or anything. And, and you know, it was because it was, this is his town. This yeah. was Jeff Picaro's town. And even though Keltner, you know, was always here, but it was Jeff's town. And, uh, you know, he was incredibly nice to me. And ironically, later, Rufus and Toto were managed by Fitzgerald Hartley together. Oh, that's interesting. Which was a night. We were always just one big family. So it was kind of cool. So, yeah, joining Rufus was it. Are you good with, like, balancing your time between, you know, work and not work? Definitely. You are. That's great, man. How have you done that? Well, the, you know, you can ask any session player. There's not that much work, but uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes shit gets forced on you. But yeah, you know, I mean, even if like I was doing in the golden days, three, you know, three different artists a day, with running three drum sets around town, that gets old, and um, you know, you have to learn to back off and take a breath. That's why, you know, outside when it's nice out, I, I, and I just wrote a song yesterday, which is my copyright called Liquid Office. I have a jacuzzi and I call it the Liquid Office. And I go oh, right there, on. And I get all these ideas. There's, there's something about the water. I don't know what it is. And, uh, but I wrote this really hip song uh, this week. And um, it just, it, it, it allows me to, you know, to, to get away, you know. And I, I, I was gardening. I think I'm going to put in a garden soon. Now that we're confined, yeah, and uh, just and I'm really into vinyl, and I've got multiple areas of my house, excuse me, where there's vinyl setups, and I've I've become a hi-fi snob. Even though I can't afford to be like one of those yoho hi-fi snobs, <laughs> you know what? Oh, my speakers are forty grand. Yeah, that's a little nutty, man. You don't need forty grand groups. speakers. Yeah, and uh, these guys are they need a beaten. So that's cool that you've been able to balance uh, things. And, and uh, football, I'm, you know, if you've noticed, I'm a... Yeah, I saw your, your, your Chiefs shirt there, man. I'm a major Chiefs fan. And, and all my balloons are still inflated from the Super Bowl. So that means something. What do you think... Uh, what's this... Uh, Tom Brady just came down here to Tampa. What do you think of that? Well, first of all, you guys had a good team, you know. Yeah. And... Um, you know that you bet your ass that they're going to protect his ass on that offensive line. So what you know, you know the day Tom goes down is, you know, bye bye Tom. Oh so, yeah. Uh, I think it's, you know, and ironically we do come play you guys. I think we're we're are gonna. You, play. Are you, the Chiefs are playing down here or? Uh, oh uh, really? I, we're, well, I don't know. I have to find the schedule. I don't know if it's up up there or down there, but I, I I'm just glad he's out of New England. Yeah. You know, because New England, they, they got all real full of themselves and, uh, you know, and there's it's some special. We just came and kicked their ass so twice. So it's like, there's, you know, there's a new sheriff in town. Do you follow, like, do you go to road games and shit? I used to go back to Arrowhead when I could afford it. Yeah, because I have friends with boxes. Oh, that's cool. Oh, it was, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, you know, unless you're there and it's, you know, tw 10 degrees below zero, which yeah. is uncomfortable, but... um yeah, I was. Uh, I'm a major supporter of the team. That's really cool, man. Tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Ooh. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess. Uh, um, I guess I've learned what my parents instilled in me, and I, and I'm applying that. Which is. Uh, uh, I guess patience and love and uh, knowledge. That's cool, man. It sounds like you had a really good childhood. You, you seem like you have some very fond memories of your folks and stuff like oh, that. Oh, it was fantastic. Even after they got divorced when I was seven, you know, we still had a, 
you know, small town working thing. It was good. Yeah, well, you say your dad was four houses away or four blocks away or something. Yeah, like four that? blocks away. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty nice that that they were able to work that out for you guys, man, for you and your sister. Yeah, I mean, you know, I wasn't able to actually get custody with him, and back in those days, the parent, the father, couldn't get custody. Oh, I know. I went through this back in the ni- early nineties. And, and ironically, he tried to get custody of the only me, which was kind of weird. I thought. Happiest time in your life. Ooh. Well, is that not counting when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl? <laughs> whatever. If that's the happiest, it's whatever it is. Oh, man. You know, there's a whole bunch of them. I can't, you know, when winning the Grammy uh, on stage with the band was really, really uh, rewarding. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm just grateful, you know, now, you know, these days just to wake up, you know, and uh, be on the north side of the dirt. Yeah, man. That's just what happens. I think as you get older, you, I mean, that's important, man, you know? Yeah. Do you have any non-musical superpowers? <laughs> um, that's funny because my oldest son is like really into superheroes. I swear to God, I think you would probably ask him, he'd be like, yeah, he goes, I'm, I'm this guy from that. And so, <laughs> uh, I mean, I can, um, I, I'm very good at reading people. So uh, I, I think I'm good. I'm a good diffuser of, of uh, conflict. Man, I cannot imagine how that served you in your business, man. When you walk in and you're in a session, because you got to assess that shit pretty quickly. Who's who and, you know, who's the dad and who's like, you know, how to interface and, you know, back off and not back off. You know, that's yeah. a very important skill. Right. How do you think, how did you get that? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, um, I mean, I, re- I remember in high school, uh, I was a good f- physics student. <laughs> so, physics? Uh, yeah. That's and, a difficult uh, subject. yeah, I, I, I mean, I was always, I was always really just busy all the time. So always occupying brain space. Yeah. You know, and not, not getting bored. I was a terrible reader though, like books. I hated reading books because of my vision. And uh, your bad vision. Well, I'm I'm plus, and my dad was an optometrist, so he'd do little things when I was a kid where I'd have to wear patches. Right, right now I'm wearing a plus five and a half and a plus six. Oh, so contacts. I can, I can see a you know the hair on a flea. Yeah. But uh, my muscles would get sore when I'd read, and and they still do. So, oh. you know, I was never really a good book reader. Man, you know what I had a few years back? I had Lasix because I wore contact lenses, and they did one eye. So one is for distance, and the other oh. one. And so what happens is it took a while. It generally only takes two, three months, but it took like six or seven for me to them to adapt so you could sort of see things. Oh, wow. It was, and it's the best thing I ever did because I, I, I hated I was wearing contacts for so many years, and it was just nice to put them down. Yeah, well, good for you. Man. Yeah, lucky about that. Uh, outside of gardening. And vinyl. Any other hobbies? Uh, I like cars. Old I, cars or new cars? Uh, well, now in my present situation, both are older. But uh, <laughs> if I uh, somehow found the fountain of gold, um, I would uh, have a lot more cars. So uh, I've always been a car guy. And, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've driven a Bugatti Veyron before. What's and, that like? Oh shit! I'm <laughs> driving a jet on, on you know, in uh, in linear fashion, you know, uh, with just X and Y, you know, no Z axis. So it was, it was very, very, very hip. But uh, I, that's a tough habit. Yeah, it's expensive yeah. habit. The expensive habit. So. Yeah. Hey, two more questions. Uh, toughest decision you've had to make, or most difficult thing you've had to do? Ooh. Wow. God, that's a, that's a, I don't know if I can answer that. I mean, um, you know, somehow you you led me into this Barbara Streisand thing, but uh, it was, you know, it it, it was all good. Um, I mean, that was, I guess uh, this is kind of a sad story, but uh, we were playing uh in berlin at hitler's outdoor complex 
with Barbara's wow. Just a beautiful place. I mean, if you really looked at it from that angle. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, we're, we're on stage, and uh, I think it's where the Berlin Philharmonic plays outdoors and shit. It's all out in the country, and there's all these tunnels that Hitler could run away in the old days. And Barbara's looking up, and she, and she goes, what are those things up there? And she didn't know what they were. They were turrets, gun oh. turrets. So... But that wasn't it. It was my sister, Judy, was dying, and um, she had a, a cancer sarcoma of the left hip. Oh, and I was out on the sorry. road in Europe with Barbara. But, well, you know, it, it, I mean, I, I ended up putting a smile on my face. So we're done with the concert, and I knew shit was happening, and I could see the management all come out, and I go, and so it was blah, blah, starts crying and shit. So I, they flew me overnight back to San Antonio via Paris and the whole band went to Sweden and she took, she canceled the, the, the show and she said she had a cough. I honest to God think she was doing that for me. And the whole band was at some wow. fucking uh, vodka ice house getting plastered, sending me pictures where I'm burying my sister in San Antonio. But oh so I fly back and meet the band in Manchester, England and it was almost like I wasn't in the band anymore. I felt really disconnected. And, but I'm playing, and then at the very end, Barbara, um, she, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, what do you call it when you, <laughs> she designated the song, um, oh God, what was it? Uh, um, Oh, shit, I'll think of it in a second. And I had to play brushes on it, and I just, I'll think of it, but I just, I just bawled my eyes out while, while I'm playing this, and it was... Uh, oh, oh God, she dedicated I, it to, to, to the yeah, memory of your sister. sister. And, uh, That's heavy, man. And, and it was like, that was kind of the hardest thing. I, I, I shouldn't remember the song. I'm probably blacking it out for a reason. But No, uh, that's heavy, man. That's, that's It was like, I'm playing my ass off, and tears are like blowing all over the snare drum, you know? Man, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, that was a tough one. But, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I always try to stay jovial about stuff. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow, that's heavy. Sorry, man. That's all right. And then uh, biggest change in your personality, JR, over the last 10 years, and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a part of aging? When I, when I was uh, getting into – I had a record deal – uh, in 89 on uh, WTG CBS Sony with a guy named Mark Williamson. It was called Bridge Too Far. And Lionel threw us our private party and it was blah, blah. And so I, th I was thinking, great, I'm going to be out of sessions. You know, fuck this shit. I'm moving on. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the record company goes, well, we have to spend all our money on Richard Marks. Well, we can't <laughs> on you guys. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. So we're doing more sessions and, I'm on a session with Dean Parks and Dean Parks and I'm really antsy and I'm going through a divorce and I think I'm short, short tempered. And Niall Rogers used to say of me, I'd leave my car running while I did a session and uh, which was not true. Um, and so I'm playing, I'm playing and apparently uh, uh, I, I was a little quick to jump uh, and, you know, probably angered and, and probably voiced it to whomever producers or players or whatever. And Dean Parks grabbed me and took me aside and said, uh, you know, I know you're going through some shit and, um, you know, you know, you need to try to just calm down and, and be yourself and, and relax. And, and if they ask to do another take, do another take and uh, don't worry about it. And those are some of the greatest words that I, I was ever told. So, uh, you know, from that point on, uh, I became, I think more aware of, uh, of the people around me and, uh, you know, you, you don't want to piss people off, you know, you're yeah. working with and playing with people. So I think I, I learned that as like, that, you know, don't let your ego get in the way of this. This is just human one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and yeah. listen, this is all we have. Yeah. And, and, and that's a tough situation to be in, man, because that is such an emotional, like, like guys are measuring your cables. Yeah. 
Try, I mean, no, I mean, it's just like, I, I wasn't surprised when you said, it's just the absurdity of it all, like, is, is really painful. Plus the kids, and all, I mean, I, I get it, man. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, first of all, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. It's really kind of you. Um, and I want to just tell people, uh, remind people about the, the Bronx USA soundtrack that you're really proud of. Uh, where can people see that movie? It's, uh, uh, I think it's native to HBO. Okay, native to HBO. Uh, in, well, I think you can buy it now, too. And, uh, you know, you can download it through uh, all, all the avenues. Okay. So you could stream it, and uh, it's on HBO. If you have HBO, you could check it out there. And he recorded at his studio, which, as I said before, sounds better than Capitol. Uh, yeah. Also, if, um, man, do you uh, want to talk about, uh, you do a lot of producing and engineering out of your studio. You want to talk about some of that? Yeah, I mean, my engineering is is per, I am not the final engineer, because if, if I, but, you know, I'm running a digital console, I'm running a Yamaha uh, uh, DM2000 the VCM console, which is a, a four or five layered console, and you got to understand about, you know, uh, digital, digital audio, or digital analog, analog back to digital, in your IOs and all this different stuff, not only that, and, you know, uh, uh, Pro Tools, so I, I'm, uh, sponsored by Avid, thank God, because uh, they've been really instrumental in all the work I've done, and it's kind of like the, the mainstay. So, you know, you have to understand about engineering and about sounds and about frequencies and about latency and about all this other stuff. Uh, but I've been producing for a long time now, and um, I think one of the first things, I mean, I was I, I being a co-producer in Rufus, and then I moved on, and I I produced a song called Hit the Road Jack that Ray Charles did uh, for this girl. Uh, and we did, it was like a, during the dance movement in like the mid eighties, you know, and it's really cool. I play it now in violin. I didn't play drums. It was all programmed back in those days. Um, but I've always been a part of a producer of something. And, you know, by working with the great Quincy Jones and the other great David Foster, who to me are both the two best producers of all time, uh, the stuff rubs off and, uh, you know, learning how to do that, um, you know, and hopefully make other people, you know, uh, better at what they do. Who would be, if someone's listening, what would be an ideal person or group or band or artist that you'd fit well with that, where you could add value to them as a producer? Oof. Uh, <laughs> is Queen reuniting? <laughs> Uh, you, know, you know, it's I mean, one one singer I've always loved is Paul Rogers, but you know, I think a lot of these guys are yeah. like semi like out retired. Um, you know, and I went through my Zeppelin days, but um, uh, you know, I could easily fit into you too, and I would want to take Larry's gig. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I love Larry. By the way, he's a good guy. Um, but you know that 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 kind of a band uh, would would be cool. I mean, that's why I love the Frampton band so much because it was you know the same voices. Yeah, you know, a little bit more of a uh, you know humble pie vibe. You know, so like so a rock band is is really going to be your forte. I like well, I like rock bands. I mean, I you know I always say to Greg Fillinghans, you know, the great keyboard player from Quincy, he was our keyboard player. And I call him up down and I go, man, we need to put a band together again. He goes, a band together. He goes, we have a band. <laughs> we just don't work all the time. Yeah, yeah, right on. So he's got a point. Yeah, it's probably rock with R&B roots, you know. I've got some great players I play with, like Dave DeLome and uh, Tarek Akoni on guitar. Just a great guitar player. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're working on some things right now. Very cool, man. If you want to... Uh reach out to JR and you think and you're interested in work with him either as a producer or you're interested in hiring him to do drum tracks for you, uh, go to his website. It's John And he's got a contact form up there. Just be respectful and let him know like what your interest is and what kind of, you know, give him enough information that he could form a logical answer to, to figure out what's going on. And if it's a fit, you know, I'm sure you guys will uh, connect, but cool. go to John J.R. Robinson.com. Beautiful. You know Great. Any, did I forget anything? Is there anything else you'd like Please. to promote? Uh, I could give you a fingerprint or hold on. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I, 
I, I've got a whole bunch of stuff to promote, but I don't really, you know, I'm working on something now that I can't talk about. And uh, it's very technologically sound. Awesome. So, you know, I think a lot of us are thinking the way I'm actually putting that out there, but uh, uh, this could be really cool. My uh, drum company, DW, has uh, got some really cool things coming out. And, of course, Peisty Symbols, I want to thank. And, uh, you know, Remo and Innovative Percussion and Zoom Cameras and Avid. And, uh, God, there's, you know, I, I have a list of, of uh, everybody's been really, really very, very supportive, especially during these, you know, dark times. The David Foster thing, we are scheduled and rebooked uh, October for about two weeks and then we do about a 35 day run in in january february of 2021 uh, yep so uh, that's awesome uh, man so hopefully hopefully this curve will go away and uh we can get this live thing uh you know back in the saddle because i think everybody, everybody and you know you're gonna see a huge difference of people after this i hope so man i hope people will think a little more and be a little nicer and not let stupid shit and judgments just take over their lives man you know yeah i agree i agree and, it, and it'll, it'll happen i think this will be you know i just uh i don't understand why bill gates wants to shoot me up with a fucking chip <laughs> i think we need to shoot him up with a chip <laughs> hey man when your uh, record comes out please come on the show we'd we'll, we'll love to uh, turn people on to it all right i will and if i only release a single i'll still come back on right on man Hey, listen, uh, thank you very much for everything. Hold on, let me wrap up. And thanks so much, JR. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to John J.R. Robinson. Again, if you want to connect with him, go to his website, johnjrrobinson.com. And if you're looking for tracks or, you know, talk to him about production, just, you know, give him a heads up and, give, you know, be respectful of his time, obviously. Uh, most important, remember that, especially nowadays, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar or your drums and have fun. Till next time, right. peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Thank you, brother. Bro, I love you, man. <laughs>